All right, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Coffee with Colin. I am your host, Colin Egglesfield, and on this episode's or this uh, episode, I am excited to introduce you to someone who I recently met. Uh, he's someone who I would consider on another realm of spirituality, of mysticism. And as I continue on my journey of trying to discover and uh, create more fulfillment in my life and share that with the people in my life and uh, and just essentially create more of a, a life of meaning and connection. He's someone who I recently met through my mastermind that I'm a part of with a woman named Catherine Porritt. And I've just been blessed with being able to meet so many incredibly inspiring people. And this, uh, this guy who I met a couple months ago um, is just uh, someone who I admire a lot. And he has written a book that is really resonating with me on so many different levels. And it seems like when I'm reading this book, it seems as almost as if like uh, we are brothers from another mother or brothers from another spirit realm or something. And I think we all recognize when we meet people in our lives who we feel like we've got a deeper connection and we have a sense that we've known them from another place or another realm, another dimension. And as I've continued on my uh, spiritual path of discovery and uh, finding out where my true purpose is in life. And I think some of us are getting to that place in our lives where we are seeking deeper fulfillment. Uh, we're recognizing that some of the things that we've grown up with and some of the philosophy, some of the uh, ideologies that we've grown up with maybe just aren't creating the fulfillment that we are craving or we're recognizing that maybe some of the myths that we've grown up with, uh, we're starting to evolve beyond them. And as I've been reading my next guest's book, I've recognized that a lot of what he talks about is a lot of the things that I've been thinking about, a lot of the uh, ideas that have been resonating with me throughout my travels. Um, growing up in the Midwest, you know, I, grew, I grew up as uh, someone who went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, and I felt like what I loved about religion and uh, the organized part of it was that it was a connection to that deeper part of me that I knew was uh, was something that was important to who I am. And as I've gotten older and been able to travel and just meeting different people from all over the world who practice different religions, I kind of started to question the deeper underlying need or reason why people seek out a spiritual connection. And it seemed to me that institutionalized religions were a means to connect to that higher purpose, that deeper meaning or that deeper purpose that I feel like we all recognize within ourselves is uh, we intuitively have. But what I didn't always understand was how these institutionalized religions could claim ownership that this was the one way to connect to that deeper spiritual uh, part of who we are or that higher being or higher purpose. And so I've been on this quest just to uh, to find deeper meaning. I've always been that person who's been very curious, someone who's been uh, interested in the, re the, the questions of why are we here? Uh, is it to... Um, you know, are, is there a reason why we're here or is it just all kind of random? Uh, did God snap his fingers one day and put us all here and be like, OK, this is the human experiment. There you go. We're going to let you have at it. Or is he actually up there directing everything? And through my uh, my travels and my journey of my uh, I guess you could say my spiritual journey, uh, I've been meeting a lot of interesting people along that way. And I've been trying to keep an open mind about religion, spirituality, because I think once we start closing our mindset uh, um, and claim to have ownership on the one way in which things are supposed to be, I think we exclude ourselves from some incredibly uh, important ideas. And I think we can end up staying stuck in our lives and prevent agreement and we can prevent uh, workability with existing with other people. And I think where we are at in terms of our existence on this planet is that, and what my next guest writes about, is that we are seem to be in this place of uh, 
of a, uh, a crisis of maybe identity and workability with regards to how are we going to move forward in this world with this, with the way things are uh, moving so quickly and where do we fit into all of it? How do we stay connected? How do we coexist with each other without trying to blow each other up and constantly fight and argue? Because I, I know intuitively we all have the same needs in terms of wanting connection, wanting to be able to provide for our families, wanting to be able to raise our children in a safe environment. And me personally, I think a lot of what is out there is going about it the wrong way and that it's just not creating workability. And my guest that I'm going to be uh, inviting on here in uh, just a few seconds um, seems to have what I believe a really great perspective, uh, an inspiring perspective and an enlightening perspective on how we can navigate where we are at in the world uh, to create more connection, to create more meaning, to create more um, love and to create more workability with uh, what we want to do with our lives so that we are um, making sure that when we do move off this mortal coil, that we are leaving it hopefully in a better place than we came into it with. So without further ado, ladies and gents, uh, my next guest, his name is Dr. Matt Kreinheader, and he has worked over a decade as a healer for entrepreneurs and leaders, and he's seeking evolution and performance at, their, at the leading edge of higher performance as individuals and in the realm of the coaching space. He's done over 20,000 healing sessions over the course of a decade and holds a doctorate in chiropractic, a master's in acupuncture, and two undergraduate degrees. And he's the founder of the Transformation and Coaching Industry Research Lab, which I find very interesting as a certified life coach. Um, this organization that he's putting together and is uh, leading is, and he'll tell you more about it, but it's an organization that helps create um, credibility and make sure that people who are coaching in the coaching industry are providing value and that they are actually providing the results that people expect. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to introduce to the show Dr. Matt Kreinheader, author of Awakening the Mystics. Matt, how you doing? Thanks for being here. I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I'm really honored and excited to be having this conversation with you this morning. Me too. Me too. Um, so tell us, you are in, currently in Southern California right now, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Encinitas. So just a little north of San Diego. Okay. Awesome. And uh, you've been in this space of, uh, well, you've been a chiropractor for how long? Since 2001, I graduated. Um, I did my doctorate in chiropractic and the master's in acupuncture at the same time. So I finished the chiropractic a little bit earlier um, and finished the, no, not 2001, sorry, 2011, um, and finished the master's in acupuncture the next year. Okay. And a lot of what I've been reading in your book, and I haven't, forgive me, I haven't completed the whole thing, but just reading the beginning part of it, a lot of your uh, your upbringing and your your journey of getting to where you are at, you've seemed to be uh, attracted to healing, to uh, wanting to understand the deeper meaning of life, uh, which has led you obviously to where you are at right now. But if you could just uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you're at with uh, writing this book and wanting to uh, make a, a create deeper connection and meaning in the spiritual realm for people to be able to have uh, better fulfilling lives. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so like you and like many people, I grew up a little bit more traditional. You know, I, I was in church every Sunday, um, very uh, loving, beautiful Christian family. But the spiritual side of that um, left an impression on me. You know, it was I could tell that there was something really interesting happening. I just couldn't feel anything happening. So it left me in this kind of situation in my teens where I really endeavored to find that sense of connection within Roman Catholicism. And just couldn't get there. You know, it seemed like the way to to find that connection was through the priest. And in our case, the priest 
maybe wasn't all that metaphysically alive, <laughs> if you will. So it led me down this path of spiritual and, and metaphysical exploration. And I, you know, went and looked at all the funny corners and studied some of the esoteric traditions and um, ended up really finding a resonance in Zen Buddhism and mm. started a Buddhist practice, not in a big kind of outward way, but really r focusing on the practices and the meditation starting around 2001 uh, after I finished my undergrad programs. Um, from there, uh, after working a couple jobs that just weren't really an awesome fit for who I wanted to be, as anyone will do in their 20s, I started to ask the question like, okay, so so when you grow up, Matt, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. um, so I started looking at other programs I looked at uh, and got accepted into a master's in Buddhist studies program that I never did. Um, I looked at uh, MD programs, looked at ND programs, so naturopathic doctor programs, acupuncture. And when I kind of sat back, I asked myself the question, like, what's the thing that you're really after here? Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, one of these moments in life where there was kind of a voice in the back of my head that said, I'm looking for a practical application for the exploration of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So how does metaphysics work in the real world? And I realized that if I could see how people got sick, if I could see how people were in pain, if I could see how people's life got messed up, I would understand how metaphysics wasn't working. I could understand how the things were breaking down. And as I started to research chiropractic more, I saw that the basic tenet was if you can take all the undue stresses off the body, the yeah. body does what it's supposed to do. And those stresses may be physical, you know, structural, but most of what I saw is that they were emotional and mental and energetic. Um, so I went down this path of exploring chiropractic, soon realized after getting to school, there was over a hundred different chiropractic techniques. So I went to visit a whole bunch of offices and see who was getting outstanding results. I found a te technique called network that was utilizing really light contacts on the body to help the nervous system come out of long-term patterns of fight and flight and stress and tension. So, so I got to see what's called network spiral analysis. Spinal what? analysis. Yep. Spinal analysis. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, so in that, I got to see when people's lives were messed up, when they were in stress, if we could take that stress off, they could get in touch with their emotions, they could feel their body, they could not be afraid of their pain, they could actually go into the experience of, of reconciling the pain, there was massive transformation available on all levels. So for 10 years, I used my chiropractic office as a transformational research lab to see how people move out of pain and stress and suffering and into awakening and transforming and and moving the relationships forward and being successful and purposeful in business um and that led me you know more towards where i am now i got the 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 way i describe it is the book started talking to me in about 2016 it's like oh, there might be something to write here and then it talked to me the whole way through the writing process and i often tell people you know this book wrote itself through me for us so mm -hmm. I don't really hold it so much as Matt's the author and Matt's this kind of whatever. It's like the book needed to happen. I happen to be the aperture and portal that it wrote itself through. So since then, you know, more coaching, a lot more coaching in the last eight years, coached all kinds of successful entrepreneurs and help people grow businesses. That's been really fun. And now working um, with the research lab and getting that up and running. And on a, I guess a, a, deeper level of looking at the human body and healing, because I've always been interested in that. I have a degree in biology, pre-med, I was planning on going to medical school. Uh, but at the University of Iowa, there were a group of nurses that taught something called healing touch, therapeutic touch, Reiki. And when I went to that weekend, uh, they talked about chakras and these merid energy meridians. And that was just something completely brand new and and it was just like fascinating to me but it almost seemed magical and almost like unreal so to speak mm -hmm. uh, the more i started to delve into this and learn about shiatsu which is a japanese pressure point massage therapy i uh, started reading just about books like the celestine prophecy and books that were more into the realm of the spirit world and it didn't always seem to align with my, what I was learning in religion, 
And so that's where I've been trying to figure out how to reconcile or is there a reconciliation to be made between the spirit world and religion and where, what are your thoughts on, is there a, a, a way to connect these two or is there always going to be um, this divide with uh, people believing in certain ways in which to connect to that spirit world? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think I, I, I came to the place for myself that I wasn't looking for reconciliation that was seeking an answer, but I was looking at holding a synthesis of views and being able to inhabit multiple perspectives and see the relationship between those perspectives. So is what we learn in traditional medical programs and for me, a chiropractic program, you know, is that all true and accurate? Yes. Is what has been taught in religions, for the most part, with some distortions, of course, uh, mostly accurate? Yes. Is also the thousands of year old practices of acupuncture and looking at energy meridians and chakras, is that also accurate? Yes. So when we can hold that they may all be true, then we start to look at the world in a different way and we can drop some of the rigidity. Um, the challenge with the, what in philosophy they call the materialist worldview, which is we're just this body. Mm -hmm. We're just a physical form. We need to take drugs to fix something in the body or we need to have a surgery is that it works for some things, but it's just proven not to work for a lot of things. And I would say that most of the time when someone needs acute kind of intervention, you know, they've broken their leg. I love Western medicine for that. When someone has long-term chronic enduring illness and you prescribe drugs for that, most of the time I've seen that there's somewhere that life is out of alignment, the energy is off. And by energy, in this case, I mean primarily emotion or the the expression repression of emotion um, or the connection between thought and belief. You know, there's a, a, a stack of what a human is. We are physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, mm -hmm. and then social, cultural, and other realms as well. But in that physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, the, the medical establishment mostly looks at the body and the material physical. S uh, psychology will look at the mental but it doesn't touch so much all of those areas. We really need to uh, kind of appreciate where all of these aspects of self, what they're experiencing and where they're moving to understand what a real healing is and how that needs to happen. And with medical school training the way it is right now, do you see a shift in the way in which modern Western medicine is starting to incorporate some of these Eastern philosophies of healing? Um, my short answer is no, but expanding on that a little bit, you know, what I've seen is that there's a lot of good medical doctors who like anything else, you know, you're not going to get all the training in medical school. You need to go out and do courses and find other trainings afterwards. So like chiropractic school is the same way, you know, it, they teach you the bare necessity to get into practice. And that's yeah. probably the right role for those institutions. But for the curious doctor, you know, I think that there's really a lot of ground to cover in doing some advanced um, nutritional training and really understanding how people operate in space with each other. Because they're, you walk into a room and someone's been in a fight, you feel that. No one would deny that that's the case. You feel something in that room. Mm -hmm. So if you take that first person example as a real phenomenon, wouldn't you be curious about exploring that more? And if someone's constantly experienced that state of having been in a fight and mm -hmm. then they get sick or they they become disordered or, you know, like there's a mechanism happening there. Wouldn't it be useful to understand that mechanism? So I think that there's, you know, it's a, any practice of being a professional is a never ending journey of learning more and more. Mm -hmm. And when doctors and healers become curious, they can go out and find kind of where that stuff lives and, and what they need to study. And just on a, a, I guess a more global perspective about the work that you do. Um, you mentioned how, you know, it seems like we're at this, 
this uh, this precipice or this uh, singularity where you're we talk about you know government and social systems and philosophies are coming to a head where you know not to be an alarmist but yet uh, there's this you talk about the veil that we all tend to live under or covered by that prevents us from really seeking the truth of what we need to be doing in order to create a world in which we feel safe in that we know that we're going to be passing on to our future generations. That's going to be a healthy place to live in. Um, I mean, that's a big question and we're seeing it play out within the world with, you know, in front of us where I just feel like more so now than ever, than I can ever remember, there's just seems to be the planet seems to be anxious and angry. And I don't know if um, many people out there believe in like a planet consciousness or a, a collective consciousness. Uh, Cause this is what you start to touch on in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that and how do we move forward from an empowered place and not feeling like, well, I'm one person. What can I do? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big question and, and I've thought a lot about it in a lot of different domains. So I think probably the most important thing that I can say is if, if people are having intuitions and feelings like things are really messed up, I think that's accurate. You know, that's true and real. There's more chaos, more strife, more division now globally than maybe ever before in history. Why do you think that? I I think that there's a number of reasons. uh, And then there's also some mechanisms. So in part because technology has been advancing faster than our connection as societies and as humans, both inside ourselves and outside between people, we're at this asymmetry of what we're exposed to, what we can make sense about, what is actually meaningful, what's distracting, and how we take that data and do something with it in our life. So the abstraction, the technological, the kind of limited mind space, and in some respect, social media for many good that it's created. It's also created a lot of challenges, as we know. But all of that, I think, are symptoms of something more real that's wanting to happen in our own lives. And I think that that's the big uh, journey that we get to take in the next number of decades is back to the real. And by the real, I mean, what does it feel like to be a whole connected individual? What does it feel like to actually be able to sit with all of our emotions? What does it feel to meaningfully steer our life in a direction that feels alive and bright and capable and fulfilling? Mm -hmm. And then what does it mean to take that sense of connection and bring it in proximity with another human being who's in that same practice and form real, authentic, interconnected relationships And then if that could ripple out into the world, what does the world look like? You know, I think that's really the most compelling thing is how do we become more real and how do we make real connections? And then how do we utilize those connections to beat back the the despair and the disillusionment and the division and some of the systems of control that are part and parcel of that? Do you find institutionalized religion as a barrier to allowing that to happen? I find it to be a really useful stepping stone. It's really the right thing for some people at the right time. And then there's going to be a a certain point where for some people they transcend it and they have to let it go and they have to destigmatize all the things that they learned within that religion. But it's, it's a useful, um, it's a useful part of the layer cake. Right. Because there's there's a lot in organized religion that have done beautiful things to help people in in the less fortunate and a lot of people who have gotten a lot of solace going to church. And so I don't want to tell anyone who's getting legitimate benefit from church that it's not the right path. I think it really is the right path for a lot of people. And the way that church is presented or synagogue or temple, they have to appeal to the center mass of the culture. 
you know, they have to appeal to the greatest number of people to keep mm-hmm. the doors open. So if you've gone beyond the center of the culture, you've now transcended the message that is happening in church for most people. And in in my tradition, like in, in my history with Catholicism, you can go deeper. There's Christian mystics. You can read the cloud of unknowing, or you can read Plotinus, or you can go back to the origins of Greek philosophy and find some really good gems there. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't happen that they seem to be teaching transcendent experiences within most church structures. And so for people who are on this evolution and finding that they're needing something a little more real because people are leaving institutionalized religions um, pretty significantly in Europe, you know, uh, I would say almost half or a majority of uh, a lot of countries, especially the Scandinavian countries, just, you know, don't subscribe to any institutionalized religion for people who are in this place of feeling like when they go to church, they're not getting out what they feel like is on a deeper level, what is going to be spiritually nourishing to them. What advice would you give to people who are in this place who are seeking that spiritual nourishment, but not sure where to go? Yeah, I I think there's a couple things. Um, You know, for some people, it's too much of a step out to say, I, I'm ready to abandon the whole theology, you know, like they might feel a real connection to God, Jesus, Virgin Mary, and, and we'll, you know, using this Christian context again. So if that's the case, um, there's systems like um, centering prayer, which is basically a Christian way of doing deep contemplative meditation, mm-hmm. but some form of deeper introspection and some form of using a meditative practice to get in touch with what you're feeling inside and what's true inside of you, not just what you've been told from someone else, right? right? Because that brings the journey out of the mind and out of the rules and out of the dogma and into the body and into the sensation and into the feeling and what the real authentic experience is within me. And from there, there's a whole universe that starts to open up that, that, relies on embodiment. So if people are wanting authentic spiritual experiences, they're wanting that transcendent bliss, they're wanting joy, they're wanting to feel like they're they're in the Holy Spirit or they're having ecstatic communion. Like those things are really available. And it usually has occurred for people who have had practices, not just contemplations, but practices of how do I build the, the energy of the spirit in my body? How do I kind of inform my energy body of how to connect with something beyond just this physical realm Mm -hmm. and all that stuff is available and out there. And it's just, uh, you know, our own courage and openness and curiosity that gets to say, well, maybe it's time for something more, something different, something larger. Yeah. And without even, I think consciously knowing it, this is what I experienced in my acting classes where Mm -hmm. we would get up and, you know, onto the stage in front of a group of people and my teacher would run us through these exercises to get us out of our mind into our bodies. Yeah. So when we were showing up on stage, whether it was a play or in front of the camera, that we were fully integrated mind, body, and spirit. And that's when I started to feel more just powerful, more confident, and started to really understand who I was instead of someone who was just adopting or borrowing these ideas that I grew up with just because of being born in the Midwest, right? Yeah. And in your book, you talk about it's important for us to slow down from the speed of our mind to the speed of our emotions, mm-hmm. able to have that access. Um, and I would, I would, for me, meditation is one of those ways. Uh, working out is one of those ways. Uh, can you share some other ways for us to slow down and maybe talk a little bit about that slowing down from the speed of our mind to the speed of our emotions to be able to fully integrate to be able to then navigate our lives from a more empowered place yeah yeah so one of the things that i see happen often is when the emotions are up right when the trigger is happening when the charge is high we grasp for why we're looking for the reason. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Because we think if we can understand the reason, then we'll have some measure of control over the process. And what I've seen mostly in my work as a healer is that is not the case. You know, when the, the emotion is high, the emotion is, is not meant to make sense necessarily. It's meant to be felt. So it's our job in those moments not to craft a story, not to create a narrative, not to find the reason why, but to fully allow the emotion to have all the space it needs in order to move. And, you know, this is one of the things I actually uh, have such a deep respect for actors in. And what I think I hear you describing in your acting class is that there's a process. Most people live between like here and here in their emotions. They can get a little bit sad. They can get a little bit happy. They're not really comfortable being wildly joyful or wildly passionate. They're not really comfortable in the depths of despair. But in order for you to convey that experience on screen and you know, from what I understand, the camera sucks out like 10 to 20% of the energy. So you got to go even more, yeah. right? Like you have to really deeply embody what it feels like to have those sensations in your being. And there's a, a I, I think that's a really interesting pathway into coming into deeper humanity by actually enacting deeply human situations. So mm -hmm. I, I love that that happens in acting. It's one of the things that compels me to go to the movies because I love being in that experience. And then I think for most people, you know, the, the primary shift is, how do I not turn away from these uncomfortable sensations in my body that happen when these emotion comes up? How can I let myself just uh, give space for the sensations to move in the body? Because there's a wisdom that they want to bring and the wisdom will move from the body back into the mind. It's not going to happen just in the mind. we got to find it in here first. Yeah. And for people who talk about meditation as something that they try they can't do because they can't sit still and as soon as they sit down it's like oh my thoughts are racing and i have to get up and go do stuff do you have any insight or advice for people to to who are just trying to get into meditation and make it a part of their daily practice yeah two things the first thing is that it seems as though the majority of great things happen from doing hard things so in this case, the juice is worth the squeeze. It's hard. Yes, it's it's not going to be simple. It's not going to be. And I always, uh, <laughs> excuse me, laugh when people use this as an adjective. It's not going to be Zen, right? We expect a, a, a serene bliss and peacefulness. Meditation is work. We've got to learn how to get the mind off the flywheel of constantly running. Mm -hmm. So just know that there's going to be effort applied. And that's okay. That's the way it's always been through history. Um, and then the second thing is that just doing the meditation is doing meditation. So we have this uh, uh, kind of assumption that I'm meditating when I'm not thinking or I'm in this place of peace and bliss. That's not the case. The sitting down and doing the meditation and starting to watch the process mm -hmm. of how your mind is hijacking you what sensations happen in the body when the mind is telling its story, how we react to loud noises in the room, how our nervous system gets overwhelmed and overridden. Like that's a, a human fluency, right? We've got to learn how I work mm -hmm. and sitting in silence when nothing else is happening, when there's no external stimuli cranks up the volume on all the internal experiences that are occurring that we get to bring our presence to. And that over time, over days, weeks, months, and years, will start to quiet all the noise inside. And so that we can find that place where the mind just rests and becomes the, the open mirror, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but that takes practice and process. And so doing the work is doing the work. It's like acting, I'm, I'm sure. It's like you go to classes, you do exercises, and you're not gonna hit it out of the park every time. You do multiple takes, that's yeah. the work. And the first few times you do anything, it's more of a conscious experience of trying to do it. And the more you do it, the more intuitive it becomes where you're not having to think so much about it, um, where it's essentially and what I've learned through a lot of what I 
needed to learn in order to be able to walk into these rooms with casting directors, producers, the feelings of nervousness and anxiety would come up. And after doing going to therapist, therapists and life coaches, I recognized that on a deep level, I felt that I was being walking into these rooms. My subconscious was feeling vulnerable, judged, uh, and it was triggering these feelings of not being good enough, uh, triggering feelings of why would anyone pick me for this job? I haven't yeah. trained as much as anyone else. And all these feelings that have come up that I think a lot of us walk around in um, with life. So it keeps us kind of closed off and in this protective type of cocoon. And I don't know if that's maybe the veil that you, you mentioned in your book, um, when you are coaching your clients, uh, does this come up and how do you help people step out of that comfort zone of, because you said the greatest things in life are difficult and it requires us to get out and to do things that are not going to be comfortable. Um, how do you do that for your clients? Yeah. So we'll, we'll take this specific example of, of the acting, right? And and what I hear you saying is I had a bunch of sensations in my body that I didn't, I wasn't particularly enjoying when they were happening. Right. Not being able to and, breathe, sweaty armpits, yeah. like just fight or flight, total yeah. amygdala hijack. Yeah. And, and because of that stress, the brain started to create stories about why I was stressed, right? It needed to match its internal experience with its external environment. Oh, so, so I thought it was the other way around where our emotions or our feelings were created by the subconscious thoughts that we have about our experiences. That can happen. I don't experience that that's the most common way that people need to unwind it. Okay. Um, most of the time I find if they can get in touch with the sensation and let the mind relax. So there's there's two parts one is i'm familiar with these sensations i'm having sensations in my body okay i can breathe and have a sensation at the same time i can speak and have sensation at the same time i can allow all these things to exist in here and i can still be in the process of whatever it is that i'm doing and then the second part the mental part is okay as i'm having these sensations now I'm also noticing that the story of I'm not good enough, why would they, da, 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 whatever it is. How can I take one of those singular thoughts, I'm not good enough, and take it out of the assumed truth and hold it as an object of awareness in front of me? So mm -hmm. how can I look at I'm not good enough? Okay. Hmm. How would I know if that's true? Well, I'd have to understand what quote unquote good enough means. Do I have an actual definition of good enough? I don't. I don't know what that means. So it's a moving goalpost that I can never satisfy. Mm. Okay, now I'm recognizing I'm in a I'm in a challenge here because I can I've got a problem I can never solve because I've got no definition. Do right. I want to create a definition of what good enough is? Yes, I do. I want to do that. Okay, in this situation, good enough is. I came in and I delivered my lines, you know, at kind of 80 to 90% of my best practice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Was my action good enough? I hit it at 82% subjective number. I'm good enough. Look what we did there. All right. I didn't Will get the they to, <laughs> <laughs> Will they choose to cast me on that? I don't have any <laughs> control over that. They get to do their thing. I'm doing my thing. But we just solved this little conundrum. And so the types of coaching that you do with your clients, um, would you say it has to do with more of mental belief systems about their achievements or is it a combination of beliefs uh, and physical stuff that's manifesting as dis-ease or physical ailments? Yeah, I, I would say most of the time what I'm interested in is liberating people into their purpose. I want them to go make an impact in the world with what they're here to do. And mm -hmm. usually for people who have a big mission, there's something standing in the way of that. And I'm because 20,000 hands on sessions and I started every session by just putting my hands on someone's spine 
and feeling what I could feel in their system. So I got super attuned to finding blocks, finding stories and beliefs, finding really? old traumas, finding all kinds of stuff. And so that's like what manifested my putting your hands on someone. You could feel past traumas and yeah. I, how is that just a natural gift you have? Or what does that feel like or look like? Yeah. I think it's a mix of things. So one is, you know, been meditating since 2001, 2002-ish. So all that kind of information in my experience inside of me got really quiet. So there was a lot of space to be listening to what I was noticing in and around me. Mm -hmm. The second thing is uh, I'm fairly sensitive. I would consider myself an empath. So mm -hmm. there's parts of me that are naturally tuned in to especially people's emotional experience. And then I went, like I said, I used the chiropractic office as a lab. So I went through this really uncomfortable process of putting my hands on people and saying, I don't know if this makes any sense, but I seem to be getting something about your mom. Like, does that make, does that resonate at all? And they would say, oh my God, I just had my big fight with my mom before <laughs> I came in. Or they would say, no, that doesn't make any sense. And either were good for me because it was information that my sensing was on or it was off. And I got to get better at doing sensing. So I spent all these sessions like just honing and crafting my sensing so I could be more efficient, more precise with my clients. And then it just started to turn into a process of tracking energies, tracking patterns, looking at the way people were holding their body. There's a whole synthesis of things I used to find these blocks in these ways that people are, are holding themselves back or have stories that they can't contact to getting in touch with them, whether it's the sensation, the emotion, the thought, the belief, the story, the spiritual alignment, the amount of energy they have in the body, whatever it is, and how do we bring that into awareness, utilize it, transform it, alchemize it, and let them be liberated into you know, what they're doing and meant to be doing. So it sounds like a lot of what you've been doing and practicing is listening to your internal um, markers or, or uh, what would you call internal um, at receptors of what feedback you're getting? Because this is where I learned to connect to my ability to start walking into these auditions and walking into my life with more empowerment where growing up, I always felt like I had to seek outside information, outside approval for whether or not I was good enough or capable or a good boy or that people pleasing type of mentality. And the more that I started to get drilled into my head by my acting teachers that you've got to make, like with acting, you've got to make strong decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and that was difficult for me at first because I was like, oh shit, if I make a decision and if I'm wrong, then, then what? And I think what you were saying about, well, what is wrong? And what is that really mean? And the more that we can get specific about our beliefs about what it is that we are doing and who we are, we start to see that the, uh, the structure of this just starts to unravel where we see that it doesn't exist, which brings me on to the topic of absolute truth and subjective truth, which you yeah. talk about in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how these two concepts, absolute truth and subjective truth, where we as human beings can get stuck in one or the other and uh, prevent ourselves from being able to uh, connect to our the empowered parts of who we are to uh, to manifest what we want in life. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, I, I'll circle back around just for a second, because I think that there's an interesting way to hold this experience of acting. It, it seems interesting to me. You can tell me if it's interesting to you. And that's, you know, it, if I imagine if someone went into an audition and they, they knew that there was no good enough, not that they would never be good enough, but there was no such thing as good enough. And they were making a choice and executing based on passion yeah. but then there was also enough quietude in the body that they could sense and read the room and also feeling kind of what i call this like a metaphysical what's the thing that wants to happen mm -hmm. there's something here that's looking to be expressed 
And yes. if I can track and sense some of that, because the, the quiet inside is safe enough to do that, mm -hmm. I, I would be really curious to see kind of how, how that turned out as people were going on auditions. So there's that one. Um, relative and absolute truth. The, the way I hold that is we have to have a multidimensional perspective. And I don't mean multidimensional in terms of, you know, aliens and wizards and all that kind of stuff. We could have that talk if people were interested, but that's not what I mean. Um, the absolute truth is kind of this apex spiritual experience of oneness or in the Western or the Eastern traditions, they call it the non-dual, right? Um, it's this place of being able to be in contact or be itself all that is from that place when we have that experience the usual returning kind of statement is i am i am that i am you know that that pure connected absolute truth and that is true there and that is true here but here we live in a relative world built on dualisms, built on this and that, right and wrong, good and bad, black and white. So we have to navigate our truth in this relative world with finding out what's most true about me, about the situation, having genuine curiosity, having openness, being clear on our ethics and finding what truth is available because it's not always going to be able to uh, be true that we can manifest that absolute truth in this world, circumstances, people we're participating with, but we can always aim for the most good, the most truth, the most beauty. Those are my three kind of philosophical fundamentals. Everything is built on how do I bring more truth? How do I bring more goodness, more human interaction, more lifting people up? And how do I create more beauty in the world through acting and art and expression or just kind of my natural beingness and how I, how I operate. So that's how I tend to navigate those, those types of truths. And by subjective truth, is that more of an opinion of what people believe? Yeah. And, and the subjective truth is from the internal to the outside. The objective truth is the universally careful because a lot of objective truths are breaking down in society and culture right now. Um, but the kind of universally agreed upon truth out there. So my subjective truth, what we sometimes call my truth, has to be the way that I navigate my world. Mm -hmm. But if I hold it too rigidly, or if I uh, enforce my truth on someone else, now we're getting into a little bit of dangerous territory, right? Mm -hmm. My truth, my subjective inner knowing happens in that quietude and it starts to become louder and louder it's activated by alignment between the physical emotional mental spiritual and it mm -hmm. becomes a navigating tool to, to and we start to sense eh, not so much not this thing this doesn't feel right or we see oh there's something that's really drawing me towards this and there's something to explore here and that truth can be a guide for that and what are some of the objective truths that you're seeing in society that are starting to break down I'm careful with these, right? Because <laughs> these are triggering points for a lot of people. So um, I, the, the statement that I usually make is, I love every human. I don't always agree with every human's actions. Mm -hmm. So the objective truth that I see in con, uh, kind of uh, contest right now the most is what is gender? Mm -hmm. Because we have an external objective understanding of what masculine and feminine is based on history of looking at silence, uh, sci science. And then we also have a subjective truth of, I was born into say a male body, but I feel like a female. Mm -hmm. That is very true and important and right and real. And I want that person to be loved. And I want that person to be really acknowledged for that experience. Does it mean that we can rewrite everything about what masculine and feminine means? Would that be loving for the culture? I have questions about that. I don't know that that's necessarily true. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. And what you talk about how it's important that, uh, or that mystics are able to exist in this place of, um, of, truth and non-truth or uh, in the place between good or bad. And 
what I liked about how you talked uh, about how time is linear and nonlinear and by nonlinear, it's happening in all different places all at once and how time, I liked your analogy of how you consider time as like a river with a rock in it where the water is flowing towards the rock. But as it gets close to the rock, the resistance of the rock starts to push forward against the river. So it actually yeah. is like condensing time. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how this can benefit us in our daily life, this concept of time, because most of us are thinking about what we need to do in the future or regret what we did in the past. And so very little of our time is actually spent in the present moment. Yeah. And what you were touching on before with the auditions in the sense of what is necessary right here in this moment and how can I be a part of letting that unravel naturally, organically, um, what would you, or what can you share about this concept of time and how it can, it's, it's a, it's a made up concept that creates all this stress and anxiety in our lives. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think I fe feel a bit of a subtext of like, how do we collapse time to make magic? Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that one. Okay. So time exists in subjective and objective as well. The Greeks called objective time, linear time, kairos. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, chronos. And they called subjective time, kairos. So when we're in flow, when we're doing something that we love and three hours zips by and we had no idea, that's subjective time that comes from complete absorption in the moment. And typically, especially the more spiritual work people do, the more meditation, the more openness they create in their body, that's activating other parts of self, right? That's activating, and there's long traditions, especially in the East, of energy bodies, right? The, and those energy bodies give us access to other parts of the cosmos or, or universe or spiritual realms. Again, I'm careful with the woo-woo language. I know not everyone likes that part of it. Um, but there's a long history of the scholarship of that. So when we can be in that part of self that is not stressed, that is not committed to focusing on the past or the future, that can just be in the full real, the full experience, the full embodied participation with this present moment, mm -hmm. usually there's enough relaxation and openness for the energy bodies to start to operate. And again, bringing this back to, to acting, my sense is that when those energy bodies are really alive, there's a force that can show up and that force can be forceful or it can be soft and draw people in or it can cast an emotional expression or, you know, there's something else that's going on. And you've probably seen this. You've watched someone on set. You're like, what is happening right now? But there's a thing happening, well, right? It's finished the scene and, and it's like, what the hell just ha happened? Like I, it was like, I was here in this moment, but it was something, and you talk about the divine. Yeah. The divine works through us as us. And that's how you describe how this book came through you. Yeah. It was almost as if like you just opened up your full awareness to allow this book to be just written through you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's how, the magic occurs, you know, the magic is in nature really happening in, in deep and powerful ways. And when I say nature, I mean, from the earth all the way up through the heaven and finding those aspects of us that are truly spiritual and truly beyond just the human physical being. And that's the state I am orienting to as often as possible. That's where the magic becomes real and alive. Um, and that's the place that I really I get the sense that people know that that's available, but they don't always know how to get there. So for those who are who are saying like, yeah, I, I feel it's out there, have faith, continue to move forward, continue to seek for it. You know, the, the searching in the path is really like, it's so sacred in and of itself. It will find you. Keep looking in all the dark corners where people aren't looking. It's out there. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, I just loved how you opened up your book with describing how the mystics um, 
are all about magicking as we have just been touching on and how it's embracing everything and uh, how would the Buddhists describe it as swallowing the river at its source yeah, and taking it all in and not excluding yourself and having such a narrow mindset about different ways or new ways or uh, other ways for us to be able to navigate and coexist. And that's where I, I feel could be the, the easiest way for us to start unlocking um, or creating an opening for us to have better conversations where we're not talking over each other, where we're actually truly seeking to understand each other's points of view and perspectives without immediately trying to annihilate it and cancel each other. And that's, yeah. that's something that I think is uh, crucial. And that I, what I love about what your, your book talks about. And um, if you guys want to know how to get Matt's book here, let me just pull up. Um, they can go to your website. Let me put up here. <laughs> Dr. Matt K.com, right? Yes. And your book, Awakening the Mystics, is available on Amazon? Yep. Yep. And uh, I would highly recommend everyone out there to check this book out. Um, it resonates with me on so many different levels. And uh, I'm excited to continue on with my reading of it and <laughs> to finish it. Um, and Matt, you do do some coaching. And if anyone is interested in learning more about the type of coaching you offer, um, they can go to your website and I believe there's a little form that people can fill out to describe what it is that they're they're looking for, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love helping people um, who I really know that I can make a meaningful difference for. And because of that difference, they're going to go out and make a difference in the world. And what would you say your legacy is that you want to leave this this world with? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I love the question and I'm careful with it because I can feel the parts of me that want to have a legacy and I'm really suspicious of those parts, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's always a little bit of ego that's just like, yeah, just right there. So I, I hope by me existing, there's been some ripple of those three philosophical fundamentals, more truth, more goodness, and more beauty. If that happened, if somehow I looked back after leaving this life and I could see in whatever way that process happens, that ripple spreading out into the world, mm -hmm. I feel like I would say I, I did it right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, speaking of auditions and uh, acting, it's that time of the show where we get to ask you what your favorite movies are. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this part of the show is brought to you by an app called Picticular. Have you ever heard of Picticular, Dr. Matt? I have not, but I'm excited to hear about it. So Picticular is the brainchild of my best friend. His name is Todd Courtney, and he created this app, and it's a movie curating app that allows you mm. to be able to, uh, it suggests movies that you may like based on your swiping pattern. Mm. So it's like Tinder meets IMDb. Yeah, it suggests movies and you swipe left if you don't like it, swipe right if you like it, and then it will learn based on your swiping pattern movies that it may think that you would uh, be interested in. So that being said, Dr. Matt, what is your favorite movie of all time? Yeah, it's such an interesting one. I mean, I, I think if I had to pick, it would be The Fountain. Darren Aronofsky film with yeah. Hugh Jackman and Rachel Weisz. Is that based on Ayn Rand's book? Or no, that's, no, the, that's the Fountainhead. No, this is a, a book uh, or a story essentially of two lovers who are in uh, meet each other in three incarnations. Oh, so wow. there's three parts of the movie that interweave. There's one part where Hugh Jackman is a conquistador and she's um, the queen of Spain. And then there's a modern day, he's a scientist. And then there's a scene in the future. It's outstanding. It's beautiful. It's Darren Aronofsky. Who's a master. Yeah. He's definitely on another level. Um, awesome. Yeah. No, I'm excited to, to watch this. Um, what was your favorite movie growing up as a kid? Yeah. Back to the Future. Amazing. 
<laughs> so good. So good. I'm seeing a common theme here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you like about Back to the Future? Uh, I'm a sci-fi guy, so you know I like the time travel theme. Uh, Marty, the uh, that character was just so compelling and fun and alive. I like the contrast with Doc Brown, um, you know. So just the the interplay and the hijinks they they got into, plus some sci-fi, I thought was really fun. Awesome. And what would you say is your favorite romantic comedy? Um. Crazy Stupid Love. Oh, great movie. Yeah. Steve Carell, Steve Carell Ryan Gosling, just amazing cast, amazing yeah. cast. And the the way they pull the twist at the end and Kevin Bacon's character, it's like really just satisfying every time I see it. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, what's your favorite straight comedy? Uh, I think I have to go with an old one here too, Ghost, Ghostbusters. Oh, yes, Definitely. Another amazing cast. Bill Murray yeah. is a, incredible in that movie. Yeah. They just don't make movies like that anymore. They don't. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shame. Um, and who is your favorite actor or male character in a movie? Uh, I, I, I knew you were going to ask this, and I, I spent some time thinking about it so hard. Um, I feel like Denzel is really right up there. But I feel like, and I feel Christoph Waltz is really right up there too. But if I had to choose one, it would probably be Christian Bale. Do you have a favorite movie of his? Um, I, I mean, the easy answer would be to say the Batman movies. They're yeah. just so incredible. Um, I really like The Machinist. Yeah. Um, and he lost yeah, I'm going to something pounds for that yeah he yeah the way he lost he ate one can of tuna and one apple a day uh, that was it i mean if you see this movie the machinist it's it's, it's hard to watch how thin he is yeah the dedication to his craft is just insane it's amazing yeah amazing yeah so favorite from him i probably i will just go with the easy route and say the batman movies Okay. And, you know, you talk about archetypes in Awakening the Mystics. Yeah. Uh, the archetype of the mystic. Because as an actor, we talk about archetypes and we design our characters based on the different archetypes that, we, um, that we've studied in acting classes. Uh, how would you describe Christian Bale's archetype? Oh. In a particular movie or in general? Um, I would say in general, he's, he's, um, he's got a consistent, um, flavor of an archetype that he brings to everything that he does. And I, yeah. I, I'm a, like, I'm drawn to his work as well and who he is as an actor. So I'm just curious what your thoughts on his archetype is. Yeah. I mean, I, I may not use archetypes in the most accurate description the way I see it, but I would say that the, the features and the qualities are magnetism, gravity, um, and, and intensity. And I think it's really the intensity that I like the most. Uh, I haven't seen the pale blue eye yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I just in the trailer, I'm like, there's a lot of intensity in that movie. Is that where he plays? Is that the cowboy? Yeah. 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 It just came out a few months ago, I think. Yeah. I believe I saw that. Um, yeah, I have to agree. His intensity and his just his commitment to the work that um that he brings, uh or the commitment to his uh just his dedication. And I don't know if you saw his uh his leaked um explosion on set where he got upset that one of the i believe it was a cinematographer that was walking around in the background oh no um and he's since apologized to it but uh, apologized for it but i can i totally can understand and appreciate when you are so focused on a singular task of uh, bringing what is necessary to the job that you're doing and anything yeah. that is the distraction to that can be incredibly frustration, especially when you care so much about what you do. Yeah. And it's definitely, yeah. uh, 
definitely yeah, my, my sense is like you're trying to create a world from the inside out yeah and you, you're like pushing this world out into the scene and mm -hmm. if there's a unnecessary distraction it's like it's damaging and jarring that thing that you're trying to emanate and yeah. i i imagine especially if you're embodying the character too who's full of passion or rage or whatever it is yeah like that that's a lot of dynamic to manage and when you're mustering up the emotions and the uh the intention of your character in the moment yeah it's, it's a slippery slope of your you've conjured up all of this like pent up angst and anger as your character it's hard not to respond authentically yeah. in the moment so yeah 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 fascinating definitely fascinating uh and last question who's your favorite actress or female character um, this was a toss up. If you make me decide, it was a toss up between Tilda Swinton and uh, Helena, Helena Bonham Carter, but I would mm -hmm. say Carter probably would be the one again, just so much intensity, so much passion and her in fight club. Oh yeah. Yeah. Off the charts. Outstanding. A part of her archetype that I, I enjoy and that is compelling is her mischievousness her playfulness, her jester yeah. her type of just getting in there and flipping things on their head. Yep. Yep. And I would say even like a sub archetype of the jester, which is the trickster. Yes. It's like it's, it's a little bit more devious, a little bit more kind of extracting and I, she does yeah. it so well. Yeah. Well, we'll have to uh, save shadow archetypes for our next conversation. Cause I'm sure we could delve into a lot of that, but, uh, uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here, for your time, for your uh, generosity of uh, sharing your wisdom and, and just your heart and your soul. I appreciate you. I'm mm -hmm. glad we got to know each other and looking forward to, uh, who knows, maybe creating some stuff together in the future. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Colin. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in a, in a bright and awake conversation. Me too. Well, have a great rest of your day and uh, I'll be chatting with you soon. All right, guys, hopefully you guys enjoyed another incredible, inspiring conversation. And uh, again, if you want to get to know a little bit more about Matt, you can visit his website, www.drmattk.com. And um, yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I loved what he talked, what he mentioned about uh, seeking truth, beauty, and goodness, and how the best things in life uh, require work. They're not easy. And sometimes it requires us to uh, do a little deeper digging and, um, and to find ways in which we can start to look at life from a different perspective. And his book, Awakening the Mystics, is definitely opening up my eyes to uh, some different ways of looking at the world. And when we start to look at different avenues or different ways and perspectives and paradigms and the way in which we see the world, man, so many opportunities exist for us to create that connection, to find ways for us to be able to understand each other better um, and to just make the world a better place, as he was talking about. And I think what resonates with, with what I uh, feel drawn to him is his desire to make the world a better place and just help people and support them on their journeys to uh, have better lives themselves. Uh, and that being said, I am starting my next Inspire uh, course, my master class next week. And if you are interested in leveling up in life and uh, learning how to look at life from some different perspectives, where we do live virtual Zoom calls, we have conversations just like this, where we can actually talk about books like Dr. Matt's and uh, some other things that I've been uh, that I've learned along my 20 year journey of personal and professional development. And uh, I invite you to uh, check out my website, colinegglesfield.com or my Instagram bio, where you can find more information about Inspire. Uh, and I'm telling you, this is six weeks of incredible conversation, uh, deep dive work into discovering more about who you are, mind, body, and spirit. And uh, it's a great opportunity to meet an incredible community of people who are like-minded and who are up to amazing things. And when you discover all of this and tap into your greatness, amazing uh, magic comes out of it. Uh, people have been writing books, have started businesses, created online stores, 
and just have created a, a deeper connection and fulfillment in life. So I encourage you to check that out. And uh, that being said, I'm excited to uh, continue on with season six of Coffee with Colin and uh, have a great rest of your week. And I'll see you guys all very soon. Take care.